let's continue on to chapter four. Now we're on section two. In section two, we're gonna go through the addition rule and the multiplication rule. Now for some key concepts in 4.2. When we talk about the addition rule, we're gonna use this as a tool for finding the probability of event A or B occurring. So this word or in the addition rule is associated with the addition of the probabilities. We will talk about this case where both A and B occur. That is an option with the addition rule, but I'll show you this, but primarily think about the probability of event A or B occurring. When I show you the calculations, this will make more sense. So then when we have the multiplication rule, now we're gonna say the probability of event A and B occurring. And I'll show you the equations for these, and I think it'll make more sense. But ultimately, the word and in the multiplication rule, it means we're gonna be multiplying the probabilities of A and B together. Whereas for the addition rule, we're gonna add the probabilities of event A and B occurring. One thing to define first is the idea of a compound event. A compound event is any event combining two or more simple events. And remember our definition from 4.1 on simple events. They're events that can't be broken down any further. And they're also events that only have one outcome. So to further reiterate this simple event or not a simple event, we can have an example of a procedure like pulling an ace from a deck of cards. So not a simple event would be declaring that we're going to pull one red card with an ace. This is not a simple event because that can be further broken down into pulling either an ace of hearts or an ace of diamonds. So there's more than one possible outcome. So again, this notion of pulling one red card with an ace, it's not a simple event because we can break that down further. There's more than one possible outcome. What is a simple event from this procedure of pulling an ace from a deck of cards a simple event is pulling an ace of diamonds specifically that can't be broken down any further. There's not two possible outcomes for pulling an ace of diamonds. There's only one possible outcome. Now let's talk about the notation for the addition rule. Now for the addition rule, we're gonna say the probability of event A or, so we have that word or in there, B occurring. Intuitively speaking, to find the probability of event A or B occurring, we're going to add the number of ways that A can occur and add up the number of ways that B can occur. There's two points of this I'll make that you'll see in the equation. So we're going to do this in such a way that every outcome is counted for only once. Okay, and we'll talk about how to do that. We're also going to take into account the number of possible outcomes in the sample space, and we practice doing that in 4.1. Now let me show you the formula for the addition rule. So we're gonna have the probability of event A or B occurring, where that's gonna be equal to the probability of A occurring plus the probability of B occurring. Now remember I said on the last slide that we don't want to count any events twice. So we add in this factor here. Well, more correctly, we subtract this factor here to account for these cases where both A and B can occur at the same time. But importantly, if A and B are occurring at the same time, it's still the outcome of just one trial procedure. One example we'll get to of this, just to give you a heads up, is if we're trying to calculate the probability of drawing an ace or drawing a heart. Well, we can have an ace that is in the suit of hearts, right? So this is when we have cases like this, where we don't want to count any option more than once. We will do examples with this with the calculations. Pictorially, the way to think about this is if we have probability of event A occurring or B occurring, but then we need to account for this overlap here. So again, like I mentioned for the ace and the heart example, if we have any overlap, then we need to subtract the probability that that accounts for. Now the terminology we'll use in the addition rule is this idea of a disjoint or cases or events that are mutually exclusive. So when events A and B are disjoint or they're mutually exclusive, it means they cannot occur at the same time. So another example you'll see in your student outline of this is that if we wanna draw an ace or we're gonna draw a king, we can't do those at the same time. 
But like I said for the last example, if we want to draw an ace or a heart, these can occur at the same time. So these would not be mutually exclusive. And in a case where we do have events A and B that are mutually exclusive, they can't happen at the same time, we're going to use a slight variation of the addition rule. This looks like this. So we'll have the probability of event A or B occurring is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. We don't need to subtract to account for anything like we did in the last example. So pictorially, when we think of events A and B that are mutually exclusive, it means we don't have any overlap. So it'd be something like this. Let me talk through some additional examples here. So example of disjoint events or events that are mutually exclusive. For example here, event A, randomly selecting someone for a clinical trial who is a male. Event B, randomly selecting someone for a clinical trial who is a female. When we're talking in terms of assigned genders, then we can't have someone that will satisfy both event A and event B at the same time. Now, an example of events that are not disjoint or they're not mutually exclusive. Event A, for example, randomly selecting someone taking a statistics course. Event B, randomly selecting someone who is a female. We can certainly have people in the class that are taking statistics and they're also females. So these two are examples of events that are not disjoint. They're not mutually exclusive. Here's that example I was mentioning. Let's show this mathematically. So for the experiment, we're gonna draw a card from a standard deck. The event that we're trying to classify is we're gonna draw either an ace or a heart. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to ask yourself, are these mutually exclusive? Well here, like I said earlier, we can have an ace that is in the suit of hearts, right? So no, we can't because we could also draw that card that is the ace of hearts. Next, let's find the probability of this event. Because we determined that these are not mutually exclusive events, then we need to use this formula of the addition rule. So the probability of event A or B is these two plus one another. Then we need to subtract for the case where both A and B can occur. Let's keep talking through this. So P of A is where we draw an ace, right? P of B can be where we draw a heart. Now that P of A and B, that would be the case where we can draw an ace and a heart. So we draw that one card of an ace of hearts. Before going to the next slide and before looking at your notes, I want you to figure out the probability and think through for these three different events. Okay, so now that you've done that, the probability of event A occurring where we draw an ace, well, there is four aces and a deck of 52 cards. Event B is when we're trying to draw a heart. So here in a standard deck of cards, there are 13 of each suit. So there's 13 out of 52 probability that we're gonna draw a heart. This next scenario we need to take into account is when we draw an ace of hearts, right? There is only one ace of hearts in a standard deck of cards. So now we have all of our probabilities figured out and we need to put those into the equation for addition rule where we have two events that are not mutually exclusive. So in this case, we know our formula. We're gonna plug in our values here. Simplifying this a little bit, we could answer as 4 thirteenths. Technically, we get our answer of 16 over 52, but we can reduce these values both by four to get our final answer of 4 thirteenths in a fraction form. If we wanted to go ahead and get the decimal, we could do that as well. Remember, you need to round to three digits past the decimal place. So our final answer here in decimal form would be this. It was really important that we looked at this event and we determined these are not mutually exclusive, so then we knew which formula to use for the addition rule. There are examples that I highly encourage you to do that are in your student outline. Let me know, as always, if you want to check any of your answers or talk through any of the solutions, okay? Here's a summary of some key points to the addition rule. So, Number one, we want to find the probability of event A or B occurring. Notice that for the addition rule, we're associating with the word or in here. So event A or B occurring. The next point here is that we're going to find the probability of A or B occurring. We're going to do this by figuring out the number of ways that A can occur and the number of ways that B can occur. 
because we never want to count a scenario twice, we need to take this into account. We need to figure out if A and B are disjoint, if they're mutually exclusive. If they are not mutually exclusive, we need to use this full formula and be sure to subtract the probability of event A and B occurring. When we have two events that are mutually exclusive, then we'll take probability of A or B is just equal to the probability of event A plus the probability of event B. Okay, so we're not gonna need to subtract anything here. Now, continuing on, we talked about something similar in 4.1 when we have this concept of A bar, where if we're calculating the probability of A bar, we're calculating the probability that event A is not occurring, right? So here for complementary events with the addition rule, we're gonna use that notation again of A bar, where A bar indicates that event A does not occur. Remember that when we're talking about probability not in a percentage, then our highest value for a probability is one, right? Probability values can go from zero to one. So this is a nice tool here. So if we have A, where event A is occurring, and we have A bar, where that's the probability that event A is not occurring, then those two added up need to equal exactly one. The way we think about this in terms of the addition rule, we can apply that as well. So we have the probability of event A or A bar occurring. Because probability needs to add up all together to a value of one, and we're using the addition rule, then we can say that the probability of event A or A bar occurring is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of A bar. This will always equal one. With that equation figured out, we can do a couple things. So because we know this, we can also rewrite such that the probability of A bar is equal to one minus the probability of event A occurring. Similarly, we can rewrite this equation as the probability of event A occurring is equal to one minus the probability of A bar occurring. Okay, so based on this rule of complements and A and A bar, these all have to add up to one because this accounts for all the different options we have. Then now that we know these add up to one, if we just have one and we need to solve for the other, we can do that using either of these two forms of this equation. Let's do an example here on sleepwalking. So based on an article from a reputable journal, the probability of randomly selecting someone who has sleepwalked or slept walked maybe is 0.292. When we're writing that in terms of probability notation, we say the probability of someone who has sleepwalked is equal to 0.292. Now here's our question. If a person is randomly selected, find the probability of getting someone who has not sleepwalked. For the solution here, I'm going to put up these equations again for our complement rules. Using the rule of complementary events, we get the probability of someone has not sleepwalked is going to be equal to 1 minus the probability that someone has sleepwalked, right? Because we just reoriented this equation here and we're using this form now, right? Because we want to find the probability of a bar where A bar in this case would be the probability that someone has not sleepwalked. So then to continue on and get our final answer, we have one minus 0 0.292, where 0 0.292 is the probability that someone has sleepwalked. We take one minus that, we get 0 0.708. Then we can say our final answer, so the probability of randomly selecting someone who has not sleepwalked is 0 0.708. Okay, so these are some really useful tools when applying the addition rule. Now let's get into the multiplication rule. So let's talk about the notation for the multiplication rule. Here we're saying the probability of A and B, those two events occurring, is equal to the probability that event A occurs in the first trial and then event B occurs in the second trial. In other words, we have two trials the first, we're figuring out if event A occurred, and the second, we're then figuring out if event B occurred. 
Similarly, you might see something like this, the probability of B with a line here and then A. This represents the probability of event B occurring after it's assumed that event A has already occurred. Let's talk about these intuitively. So to find the probability that event A occurs in one trial and event B is gonna occur in the other trial, we would multiply the probability of event A by the probability of event B. One thing that's important in both of these notations when solving these is that we need to be sure that the probability of event B is found by assuming that event A has already occurred. And we'll go through examples of this so you know a little bit better what this means. So, so being sure that the probability of event B occurring is found by assuming that A has already occurred. We'll talk about that. So putting these together, formally, the notation for the multiplication rule is we have the probability of A and B occurring. This is equal to the probability of A occurring multiplied by the probability of B occurring, but this is assuming that event A has already happened. Okay, so we can't just say the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. We also have to specify here because probability of B relies on the fact that A did occur already. One really important way in thinking about the multiplication rule is this idea of independence. So within the idea of independence, two events, A and B, are independent of each other if the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of the other. Another way to say this is that several events that are independent is if the occurrence of any does not affect the probabilities of the occurrence of the others. Alternatively, if event A and B are not independent, then that means they're dependent on one another. The classic way of distinguishing between these is if we have a bag of marbles and we draw out one marble. If we put that marble back before drawing the second, then technically event A drawing the first marble is totally independent from drawing the second marble in event B. But then the other scenario would be if we draw a marble from a bag, that's event A, we don't put that marble back and then we're trying to figure out the probability of event B occurring. That's the really classic way to think about the example of events being independent or dependent on one another. Let's see this example. So screening drugs and the basic multiplication rule. Below we have 50 test results from subjects who use illegal substances. From those 50 test subjects, this study found that 45 of those individuals produced positive test results and five produced negative test results. I skipped ahead to this slide, but we're gonna come back to this after I talk through the examples. I do wanna mention here, so when we have independent events, that was the same way as saying we replaced that marble before selecting the next one. So in terms of wording, if we have sampling with replacement, then those are independent events. On the other hand, if we have events that are dependent, remember that analogy of putting that marble back in before drawing the second one? If we don't put that marble back in, then we're not replacing it, right? So then event B is dependent on event A. I want us to go back to this example now here. So now we know this wording of with replacement. The marble analogy, we're putting the marble back so event A is independent of event B. So for this problem here, if two of the 50 test subjects are randomly selected with replacement, find the probability that the first selected person had a positive test result and the second selected person had a negative test result. In part B, then, we're going to take part A and repeat that, but we're going to change the assumption that those two subjects are selected without replacing. So remember that terminology, if this is without replacement, then the two events are going to be dependent on one another. Let me show you how to approach both A and B mathematically. 
Here's event A. So in our solution, remember very importantly, we were told in the question, this is with replacement. In other words, if thinking about this then with test subjects is we have 50 people, we're randomly selecting one of those people. Now we have 49 people to select from, right? Well, that is unless we are told this is with replacement. So with replacement, we select one person, then we're sort of replacing that person back into our selection, then we're selecting another person. So in the first part of A, we're gonna find the probability that the first selected person had a positive test result. Let's figure that one out. For a positive test result, we had 45 out of 50 test subjects, right? So the probability of getting a positive test result from a randomly selected individual is gonna be 45 out of 50. Now again, so importantly, this is with replacement. So we're sort of putting that person back into the mix and then we're picking a second one all over again. So then here, the second part of this is saying the second selected person has a negative test result. Well, then we need to figure out the probability of that. Remember, this is with replacement. So then we have all 50 people to select from again. So then the probability of getting a negative test result from a person is five out of 50. Let's put all those together and get our final answer here for part A. Now we're gonna use that equation for the multiplication rule where the probability of the first selection is positive and the second selection is negative. This was all with replacement. Again, here's what we figured out on the last slide, the probability of getting a positive test result and the probability of getting a negative test result. With the multiplication rule now, we're gonna multiply 45 over 50 by five over 50 and we get our final answer here. Now, I challenge you before going on to part B to consider how these numbers might be different when we have without replacement. So in a calculation without replacement, it means that we selected our first subject, but then for our second subject, we're not selecting out of all 50 people again, right? Because that one person wasn't replaced back into the mix. After the first event of picking someone with a positive test result, it means we took one of these 45 people out of our 50 people and they have a positive test result. Now we're not replacing that person back into the mix. So now we have 49 people to select from. So then our second scenario here, our event B is getting the probability of an individual with a negative test result. So remember for part A, our negative test result, we had five out of 50 probability. But here without replacement, we still have five that could get a negative test result but we're only selecting out of 49 people now. So now putting these together, we had the probability of the first selection is positive, the second selection is negative. That's the same from part A. The positive test result was 45 out of 50. And here for part B though, that second part of someone getting a negative test result is only five out of 49 now. So now again, we're doing the multiplication rule. So we're gonna multiply this probability by this probability and we get 0 0.0918. Okay, so hopefully that's clear this with replacement or without replacement. I think it does make more sense in terms of marbles, but we can actually apply this to people too and to any test subjects for that matter. Here's that slide I'd skip forward to, so now we can talk about it again. So in the world of statistics, sampling methods are of course very important. Now again, we just talked about this, we just did that full example. So sampling with replacement means selections are independent events. We're gonna figure out the probability of event A, and then we're gonna put that back. We're gonna replace whatever sample we had taken out the first time, then find the probability of event B. So here we consider event A and B independent. Then here sampling without replacement, selections are dependent events. That scenario we just did, we selected one out of the 50 people. We didn't put that person back. We didn't replace that person. So then without replacement, we're finding the probability of event B. In this case, event B is very dependent on what happened in event A, right? because we don't have the same selection now for event B as we did for event A. 
Now, before I go to the next slide, I want to point out that sampling without replacement gets a little bit more cumbersome, right? We had to figure out it was five out of 50, but then we had to factor in, well, one person's missing, so now we have five out of 49. So it's a little bit less straightforward of assuming that events are independent and we can consider them with replacement. That's where this next rule comes in. This is the 5% guideline for cumbersome calculations. So when we're sampling without replacement, it means we have to factor in one minus what was in the denominator. But to get around that, when the sample size is no more than 5% of the size of the whole population, we can then treat those selections as independent. Even though they still are dependent, we can treat them as independent. It makes the calculations a little less cumbersome. These two bullet points you've seen now, I just wanted to put another note in here. So recall when we're sampling without replacement, we had to adjust that second probability. But then with this guideline, this rule, we can assume that events A and B are independent. We can treat them with replacement. I also just put a reminder here on the definition of events being dependent on one another. It's essentially the opposite of events being independent of one another. And again, as we saw in part B, those without replacement calculations were a little more cumbersome, a little less straightforward. Let's go on to this example now and apply that rule. So we can assume that three adults are selected at random without replacement. We're selecting from this very large population of adults in the US. We're told in the problem we can assume that 10% of adults in the US use illegal substances. Find the probability then that three selected adults use illegal substances. So as stated in the question, the three adults are selected without replacement. This implies that event B is gonna be dependent on event A and event C on those two events. But here it is more straightforward if we can assume that calculation can be computed when we do have replacement. Before we know if we can apply this rule, we need to figure out what is 5% of this large number of this population. Well, I think clearly the size of three is definitely no larger than 5% of this population. Let's show this really quickly mathematically. To convert 5% into a decimal, we're gonna take that percentage divided by 100, or also moving that decimal point over to the left two times. So we're going to get 5% of this population. We first need to figure out 5% in a non-percentage number. Then here in this bullet point, 5% of the population is 0.05 times this number. So it's still a very large number, much greater than three. This confirms that we can use this guideline for our calculations. Let's talk through the solution. So we can assume the probability of all three adults using drugs or illegal substances is what we wanna find out from this problem. Because this follows the guideline that three, our sample size is way less than 5% of our whole population, and we can treat all these cases independently. That will help simplify the calculation just a little bit. We know we're going to use the multiplication rule here because really the way to word this is the probability of the first person selected does use illegal substances and then the second person selected also does use illegal substances and the third one does as well. We're not saying or here, we're saying and. So because we're saying and, we can use the multiplication rule. We're going to multiply the probability of all of these events. Now we actually have the probability already given to us in the problem here if you read this carefully. So assume that 10% of adults in the US use illegal substances. 10%, that's telling us our probability of an adult in the US using illegal substances. So then to reword this, the probability that one individual does use illegal substances is gonna be equal to 10%. Let's change that into a decimal form so we can do some multiplication with it. So 10% is the same as 0.10. In other words, we divided this by 100. Now we plug this probability in. This describes event A and B and C. So now we can multiply the probability of A by the probability of B by the probability of C. 
then our final answer here is 0 0.00100. Why we're including these zeros here is technically we can have three significant digits past the decimal point where these leading zeros are actually not sig figs, but these two are sig figs. If you need a refresher on sig figs, there's some really good resources on the internet, and I have some that I can suggest for you as well. So then our final answer here, there is a 0 0.00100 probability that all three selected adults use illegal substances. If we did not have this guideline and we had to go based on this being done without replacement, then we'd have to change the denominator each time to be this large number minus one for case B, this large number minus two for the third event. So this is a really nice guideline to sort of simplify things a little bit for us. To show what this would look like without that 5% guideline for cumbersome calculations, where we can approximate the probability with replacement, let's go through what the setup would look like without replacement. So 10% of our population does use illegal substances. So 10% of our original population is 24,743,683 people. That's how we set up the numerator and the denominator for determining the probability of person number one using illegal substances. Then though, without replacement, we're no longer selecting from that original whole population. Instead, we have one less person, and therefore we need to subtract one from that full population. Then we'd have to calculate 10% of that new one less person population to do the probability for the second person who may use illegal substances. So when possible, it's definitely more straightforward to work with a setup where there is with replacement, especially when working with such large values like we have here. The next topic here is redundancy. This is an important application of the multiplication rule that we've just gone over. This principle of redundancy is used to increase the reliability of many systems. For example, our eyes have passive redundancy if you have vision in both eyes, because if one of them fails, we could still continue to see out of the other one. Another application here for biology, so it's an important finding that certain genes in an organism can often work in place of each other. Another example here in engineering, engineers often design redundant components so that the whole system will not fail because of the failure of one single component. One specific example here is with aircrafts. Modern aircrafts are highly reliable. This is where critical components are duplicated, so if one fails, the other will still work. For example, in this Airbus 310, it has three independent hydraulic systems, so if one of those systems fails, full flight can still be controlled and still maintained with another one of those functioning systems. Let's talk about the statistics side of this. For example, we'll assume that for a typical flight, the probability of a hydraulic system failure is 0 0.002. In part A of this, we're going to answer, what is the probability that the aircraft's flight control would work for a flight? And then in B, we're going to answer, what is the probability that on a typical flight, control can be maintained with a working hydraulic system? Okay, let's look at A first. Remember in our question, we're given the probability of system failure. And then in A, we're asked the probability that the aircraft's flight control does work. So hopefully you're thinking along the lines of the complementary rule. So here to solve this, the probability of a hydraulic system failure is 0 0.002. That means the probability that it's not going to fail is 1 minus that value. Right, so here in this equation, we have the probability of failure and we have the probability of not failing. So those together need to add up to one. So then taking one minus the value that we know for system failure, we get 0.998. That's our answer for part A. Let's talk about part B. 
Here we have three independent hydraulic systems. We're asked what's the probability that on a typical flight, control can be maintained with a working hydraulic system. Let's talk about the solution here. So we have three independent hydraulic systems. Flight control will be maintained if the three systems do not all fail. So now figuring out the probability of all of the systems failing as we're gonna use the multiplication rule we already know the probability of one system failing. So then we multiply these by each other. So 0 0.002 times 0 0.002 times 0 0.002. And we get this very, very small likelihood of all three hydraulic systems actually failing. Here though, we need to look back at our actual question. What's the probability that on a typical flight, control can be maintained with a working hydraulic system? So now it follows that the probability of maintaining flight control is the complement to what we just calculated, right? Because here we figured out the probability of all three systems failing. So now the complement to that is the probability that it does not happen to all three hydraulic systems. So to figure out that, we're gonna take one minus this already very small number and then get this probability. We're not rounding here because this looks like one we talked about in 4.1. If we rounded this, this would be a probability of one. This is like we saw for the skydiving event. So we're gonna keep this as 0.9999992. So it's not quite with 100% certainty that all three hydraulic systems will not fail, but it's pretty close to 100, but it's not quite at 100%. A value of one would be then 100%. Let's do some interpretation here. So for one hydraulic system, we have a 0 0.002 probability of failure, right? That was in our question. However, with three independent hydraulic systems, there's only a 0 0.000000008 probability that flight control cannot be maintained because all three systems failed. So because we're using three different independent hydraulic systems, risk failure is not only decreased by a factor of one third, it's decreased by a factor of one over 250,000. How do we get that number? We can take 0 0.0008 divided by 0 0.002. We get that decrease in likelihood of failure. Not just a decrease by one third, but a huge decrease, right? In other words, by using three hydraulic systems, risk is dramatically decreased and safety is dramatically increased. Now I'm gonna summarize the addition and the multiplication rule, and then we're gonna do one more example. So for the addition rule, we have the probability of A or B, where for here, we're gonna add the probability of event A and the probability of event B, but we're gonna make sure that every outcome is counted just once. Whereas for multiplication rule, we're finding the probability of A and B, where for here, we're gonna multiply the probability of A by the probability of B. For the addition rule, it's important to figure out if our events are mutually exclusive or not. For the multiplication rule, it's important to figure out if we're doing with replacement or without replacement, or if we can make our calculation less cumbersome by using that general rule, where with that, we can assume that our events are independent. I'm gonna go through one more example, we'll do this together, and then there are some examples on your student outline. So now for this practice, we have a jar filled with seven blue marbles, eight green marbles, five yellow marbles. Our experiment is we're gonna draw out two marbles. These are the different parts we're gonna be able to answer given this scenario. Let's talk about A first. So find the probability of drawing a green marble and a yellow marble with replacement. First, the probability of drawing a green marble, we have eight out of 20 marbles in total. In question A, we're asked about the probability of drawing a green marble and a yellow marble, where for a yellow marble, the probability is five out of 20. 
one catch here is because we had with replacement, then I'm saying this probability is 5 out of 20 and not 5 out of 19. Then we apply the multiplication rule. We have a probability of 8 over 20 multiplied by a probability of 5 over 20. We get an answer of 0 0.100. Next, in question B, we're doing the same thing as part A, but we're doing this without replacement. In other words, we're going to draw the first marble, but we're not going to put it back before drawing the second marble. So here again for green, we have a probability of 8 out of 20. We're doing that first. Then in our question, we're finding the probability of event A and B, but without replacement. So now the probability of drawing a yellow marble out of only 19 marbles that are there is going to be 5 out of 19. Here we're still going to apply the multiplication rule. We're going to take 8 over 20 times 5 over 19, and we get 0 0.105. You'll notice that this is just slightly greater than the answer we got in part A, because now we only have 19 marbles to select from for our second event rather than 20. Now for part C, suppose only one marble is drawn. Find the probability of drawing a green marble or a yellow marble. This should indicate to you right away we're doing the addition rule here. Again, the probability of drawing a green marble is 8 out of 20. For a yellow marble, it's 5 out of 20. Remember, we're asked about a green marble or a yellow marble. So here we use the addition rule. We take 8 over 20 plus 5 over 20, and we get 13 over 20, which is also equal to 0 0.650. One very important detail in applying the addition rule is that I only use this form of the equation because drawing a green marble and drawing a yellow marble are mutually exclusive. We can't at the same time draw both a green marble that's also a yellow marble. So that's why here I just took the probability of event A plus the probability of event B. And that was all we needed to do for our addition rule equation here. Now there are more practice problems on your student outline. There's also more practice problems in my stat lab. Always let me know if you want to check any of your answers or talk through anything. I'll talk to you next time for chapter four, section three.